As you're taking your seats, I invite you to open a Bible to Acts chapter 27 as we continue our summer sermon series going through the second half of the book of Acts, looking at the life of Paul and the life of the early church and how we can learn to follow in their example as we follow Jesus together as a church and as we prepare our hearts and minds to receive God's word this morning, we go to our God in prayer and our first prayer is for our own hearts and minds that the Holy Spirit would make them still and give them peace and understanding of God's word this morning. Our second prayer is for our brothers and sisters in Christ that the Holy Spirit would give them comfort and encouragement in both their hearts and minds and that would point them to Jesus Christ as their Savior this morning. And finally, I ask that you would pray for me that the words that I preach will be faithful and true to God's holy scriptures and proclaim clearly the gospel of Jesus Christ as Savior. Psalm 19 says, may the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart be acceptable and pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. So in Acts chapter 27, Paul is finally out of prison. He's finally done with his trials, and he is finally setting sail for the city of Rome. And if you know anything about the life of Paul, one of the things you need to know about him is that one of his lifelong dreams ever since he became a Christian was to make it to the city of Rome and to be able to preach the gospel there, and then use Rome to be able to go all the way as far west as Spain. And so for many years, many decades, Paul's whole life and goal has been, yes, he's faithfully following Jesus, but he's got this dream in his heart to make it to Rome, to be able to preach the gospel there. But if you also look at the life of Paul, you know that he doesn't make it to Rome for most of his life, right? He, he sets up from very early on, he knows, I want to go to Rome. Even when he writes his letter to the Romans, he's telling them, I've wanted to see you guys for a really long time. And so he's been living his life with this dream, praying to God, seeking God's will for it, being faithful and obedient to God, and yet at the same time, never making it to Rome. How frustrating is that for a human being, right? If you have a dream, you have a hope, right? You have something that you long for, and you're like, I'm faithful to God, I'm obeying him, I'm praying, I'm following wherever he leads. What I want is a good and God-pleasing thing, right? Because Paul going to Rome to preach the gospel is a good thing. And so you'd think that God would look down on Paul and go, Paul, you're a really good guy. You've done some awesome things for me. You want to go to Rome and preach the gospel? That's a really good thing. Let's make it happen. But if you've been paying attention as we study Acts, we're almost to the end. <laughs> There's only one chapter left, and guess what hasn't happened for Paul yet? He hasn't made it to Rome. He hasn't fulfilled his dream, right? Now, if you are in Paul's situation, which many of us are as human beings, where we long for something, we hope for something, we pray for something, and we're waiting for it to be fulfilled, we're waiting for it to happen, and then it feels like we're getting to the end of the book, <laughs> and guess what? It hasn't happened, and it's frustrating, and it's painful, right? So if you're looking at the life of Paul, he has every reason to be frustrated and annoyed with God. Now, I don't need you to raise your hands, right? But most human beings that I've met, myself included, have had times where you have a friendly disagreement with the Lord on his timing of things or his giving of you things, right? You're like, Lord, this is good. I want it. I'm praying for it. When are you going to make it happen? At one point in the book of Acts, Paul tries to go to Rome and an angel of the Lord stops him and says, you gotta go in the other direction. So if you wanna get really frustrated, you're like, finally, I've been praying, and an angel shows up. How many of you would be pumped for that? You're just like, one night, you're in your prayer time before you go to bed, and all of a sudden, the lights come on, an angel appears, you're like, finally, this is my time. The Lord is going to answer my prayer and give me what I've been hoping for. And the angel looks at you, exactly opposite is going to happen. 
How many of you would be like, the angel can go away now, right? The angel shows up to Paul's like, actually, I know you wanna go here, but we're gonna go this way for, for a while. And Paul's like, well, how long? I don't know. Just, I'm not gonna tell you when it ends. We're just gonna go this way. Now, here's the other thing that is really interesting with Paul's life. Way back in Acts chapter 23, as we're going through the story of Paul, Paul is going to a city and he's facing threats and Jesus speaks to him and says, don't worry about it, Paul. I'm gonna take care of you. This will not be your end. And he tells Paul everything Paul's ever wanted here. Jesus looks at Paul way back in Acts 23 and says, Paul, you're gonna make it to Rome and you're gonna preach to Caesar. So if you're Paul in Acts 23, what, what are you? You're excited. You're like, ha ha, finally, it's gonna happen. Now, I know in the Bible, Acts 23 to Acts 27, it's not that long, it's four chapters and a few stories happen, but if you pay attention, it's actually about two and a half, almost three years from Acts 23 to Acts 27. So just imagine that. You have a longing in your heart you have a hope, something you've been praying for. It's God-pleasing and holy. And you're like, why wouldn't the Lord let this happen? And the Lord says, oh, I'll do it. But it's going to be a few more years. Now, let's be honest. Part of you would be excited for that, right? Because you're like, oh, it's going to happen. And then part of your heart would be what? A little bummed out. Because how many of you want to wait a few more years? for what you've been praying for and what you've been longing for and hoping for, right? And I know if you're trying to be positive and optimistic, you're like, well, I've already waited this long. What's a few more years, right? But those few more years could feel like an eternity. They could be painful. So this is the situation that Paul faces in Acts 27. I've been praying and longing and hoping to go to Rome to preach the gospel a few years ago, Jesus showed up and even promised to me, don't worry, Paul, it's going to happen. But that timing can be frustrating for us as human beings. It can be difficult to wait. Did you know that when I talk about spiritual gifts and spiritual growth, the number one thing that people come up to me in all my years of being a pastor is, pastor, I'd like to be a more patient person. It's the number one answer I always get. And then I laugh and laugh at you. And everybody goes, why are you laughing? And I go, because you don't know what the word patience means. In the Greek, the word patient means long suffering. So I'm just like, just, you know, good luck praying for that. Because you don't just get the gift of patience, you learn how to be patient by what? Some long suffering. So we could tell ourselves, well, we just got to be patient. God has made a promise. God is faithful. He's going to do what he says. But boy, those three years or however many years it feels like can feel like a lot of suffering, a lot of struggle. It could be difficult to, to maintain your trust in those promises, right? You, like, well, is the Lord really going to come through? Now, I know in church we'd all say, oh, of course he is, Pastor. But late at night, it can be a struggle to feel like, is he going to come through? It's been a while. How many more years did he say it was going to be? And so in Acts 27, this is the circumstance that Paul finds himself in. All these years of waiting, all these years of dreaming and hoping, and finally, he's going to Rome. Now, if I just told you that and you hadn't heard the scripture reading earlier in church, you'd be like, well, finally, he's going to Rome. This is great. Now, here's the other struggle for humans. The first is that waiting can be really hard. Tr having the patience to trust in God's promises that eventually he will keep them and fulfill them can be really painful and really difficult for us. The other one that's hard is sometimes we get to where we're dreaming and hoping and praying for. God gets us there just not in the way or the manner that we want to get there. Because Paul's going to make it to Rome in Acts 27, but if you just keep reading on your own, he'll, he'll make it to Rome. But he doesn't get there the way he wants to. 
Normally, commentators and historians have done the math. Normally, a ship sailing for, across the Mediterranean would take about two weeks to get to Rome in normal conditions. In Acts 27, it's going to take Paul over four months to get to Rome. And the only reason he's on a boat, it's not a cruise, it's not a vacation trip for him. The only reason he's on a boat is because it's a prison ship with a bunch of other prisoners and soldiers. That's all that's on there. So if you go back to Acts 23 and Jesus tells Paul, you're going to go to Rome. If you put yourself there, you're probably going, okay, let's go. You're not expecting it to be a what? Three more years. And you're like, well, let me, I, I've saved up some money. Let me get on the boat. Let me go there, right? And, Paul, and the angel's like, oh, no, 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 Paul, you don't understand. It's going to be like three plus years, and you're going to be on a prison ship. Paul's like, well, that's safe. He's like, oh, no, no, no. There's going to be this massive storm. It's going to destroy the whole ship. Now, if you're Paul, you're just like, whose plan is this? Who, who designed this plan? Who can, any of you ever, oh, okay, you don't have to raise your hand. I know I do that to you all a lot. Disagreed with God's methods and plans? Not even just the timing of things, but the method, right? Paul's like, I'm going to get to go to Rome. That's awesome. He's like, yeah, but it's going to take way longer than normal. You're going to be on a prison ship, and it's going to crash. How many of you would be like, yeah, that's, that's how I drew it up on Google Maps. That was my route I wanted to take. No, you'd be frustrated with God's methods and God's plans. Here's the thing. Paul makes it to Rome just like God said he would. The issue is the timing. And the issue is the method. So let's look at the story and see how Paul responds. So in Acts chapter 27, verse 13, now when the south wind blew gently, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, they weighed anchor and sailed along Crete close to the shore. So everything sounds great. It's going smooth. Everything's lining up for Paul. And then verse 14, but soon a tempestuous wind called the northeaster struck down from the land. When the ship was caught up and they could not face the wind, we gave way to it and were driven along. It's just... What they're saying is, the storm became so great for these professional sailors and soldiers that we just had to let go and let the waves and the wind take the ship wherever it's going. In other words, now take a deep breath, everybody. They lost control. Now how many of you are really nervous, right? <laughs> because most people I know, even when... The timing is not your timing. Even when the method is not your method, right? It's not the exact route you would have taken. How many of you are still feeling semi-okay and trusting the Lord if you still in your heart think, I've got a little bit of control over the ship? Now we can raise our hands and just be honest with God, right? Most people I meet are just like, yeah, well, it's okay. It's okay, because I'm holding on to this little rope thingy here. And that's going to keep the ship safe and going in the right direction. And in verse 14 says, and then they all just went like, we're in big trouble. There's no point in fighting it. And we've lost control. So now if you're on the boat with Paul, you're not in control of the timing anymore. You're not in the method of how you're going from point A to point B in your life anymore. And even the illusion of control that you've been holding on to is completely gone. There's a lot of ways we can react, right? Now, I know we're in church, and the right answer is to do what? Praise the Lord like Jonah. <laughs> right? Remember the gospel readings. And all the times that Jesus calmed the storm, you just go, amen, brother, it's going to be okay. That's one option. And then there is the more, I'll assume, common option for human beings and for myself, which is to what? Sure panic. We've lost control. We don't know the timing. Who knows where this boat's going to crash? It's not going to Rome, that's for sure. Right? Because if you're in verse 14, how many of you are like, we're totally going to crash land at Rome by a miracle? Or you're just like, I don't know where this is going to end up, but not good, right? 
That is the human reaction when we're facing situations like Paul. Right? Where it's like, I, I'm not control the timing. I'm not control the direction and how we're getting there. And I'm trying to get to this dream. I'm trying to get to this thing that I've prayed for and longed for. And I'm fighting for it. And then along the way, a storm comes along, disrupts every semblance of a plan you had, and now you feel like I've lost total control. So here's how the men react. Verse 15 and following, when the ship was caught and could not face the wind, we gave way to it and were driven along. Running under the lee of a small island called Kauta, we managed with difficulty to secure the ship's boat. But after hoisting it up, they used supports to undergird the ship then fearing that they would run aground on Sirtis, they lowered the gear and thus were driven along. There's multiple times in these verses where the phrase driven along is used because what happens? Well, we were driven along the first time, so what do we do? We're gonna try to take back control, get control of the ship, and we're gonna steer it as best we can in the face of this storm. And then that doesn't work. And so they're like, well, we've got the ship's boat. We've got the lifeboat on the side. We're going to secure that. We're going to hop into that, and that'll rescue us. And then what does it say? And then we gave up because the storm was too great that we were driven along. And then they tried to undergird some stuff. They tried to strengthen some things in verse 17. And they lowered the gear. They gave up and realized we're out of control. And it says they were driven along. Nobody likes being driven along. Right? It's this complete feeling of I'm out of control. I have, I'm not in charge of the timing of things. I'm not in charge of the plan of things. I'm not in charge of what's happening in the midst of this storm. It feels like other chaos. And they're just throwing their hands in there and going, we're just going to be driven along. Nobody likes that feeling. Nobody likes those experiences. In verse 18, it gets worse. Since we were violently storm-tossed, they began the next day to jettison the cargo, and on the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard, and then Luke has this wonderful detail to let you know how panicked these soldiers and sailors were with their own hands, meaning it wasn't the storm that accidentally just blew it over. So what are these verses telling us? The storm gets so bad so disruptive, they are so out of control, that they're like, we're just gonna throw everything overboard because it's not gonna make a difference. It's essentially resigning themselves to what? We're gonna crash, the ship's gonna sink, and we're probably all gonna die. We're just going to give up. When I was younger and, and college and then into seminary, one of my life's dreams was to get a pickup truck because I'm a guy that grew up in Texas and it's required, okay? I was just like, well, what are you going to do with your life? Well, I don't know, but I'm going to get a pickup truck. That's, as long as you do that, everybody goes, you're doing okay, all right? That was my dream. I prayed for it. I tried to save up doing work-study jobs, which means I didn't really save up for it, okay? All right? Paying for grad school and seminary, a part-time job. All right, so my dream was I want to get a pickup truck. And guess what didn't happen for years and years and years? No pickup truck. And I'm like, what? what the heck, Lord? I said it, right? Like, I was frustrated. I know it's a silly thing. I was like, you know, I'm a good guy. I went, I went to uh, Concordia. Um, now I'm in seminary, so I'm going to be a pastor. Like, oh, I'm asking for it's not that big of a deal, right? I mean, Paul's asking to go all the way to Rome. That's like halfway around the world, right? I'm just asking for a pickup truck. Now, here's the deal. In Paul's life, his issues were the timing of things, right? Sometimes we get so frustrated in our prayers, we want to get mad at God. Why haven't you answered them? Why haven't you haven't fulfilled this? Like, what's wrong with you, Lord? Like, come on now, help me out. The other problem for Paul in Acts 27 is, oh, you're gonna get to Rome, buddy, but what? Just not the way you think you're going to, not the way you want to. So one day, let's pretend I was studying late at night. I wasn't at seminary. And it was around midnight, and I decided, I'm gonna go get some McDonald's, because at that time, I was still young enough and healthy enough, I could get away with that, okay? My doctors have since told me, stop doing this, all right? <laughs> 
So I'm like, I'm going to go to McDonald's. So I walk out of my dorm room onto the seminary campus into the parking lot. Now, we don't have assigned parking spots at seminary, but usually you kind of do what every human does, and eventually you do what? You imagine yourself, these two are where I usually park. So I go to one spot where I usually park. Car's not there. And I go, oh, well, that's all right. Maybe I parked in the other spot. So I go to the other spot, and I know for certain I parked here. There's no car. Now, a reasonable person would have thought about this and called the police and said, my car is not where I left it. But I responded the way the sailors responded, in sure panic and illogical behavior. So what I did is I walked into the center of the parking spot and I looked down for my car as if it was a Hot Wheel. You know if you're standing in the parking spot and you look down and your car's not there, guess what? It's not there. It's not. And then I did this. Well, it's got to be here somewhere. Did that a few times, and then I calmed myself down, and I spun in the other direction. It's got, surely, it's got to be here somewhere. And then when I finally came to my senses, I walked back to my dorm room, crawled into bed, pulled the blanket over my head, and said, it's just a bad dream, and when I wake up, my car will be back. Um, my car was not back. <laughs> It was stolen. Now, here's the nice thing. I got a pickup truck out of it. It wasn't a nice pickup truck. It wasn't a good pickup truck. But the Lord answered my prayer, and I got a pickup truck. Now, here's the thing. We probably pray for more serious things than I was in life of praying for a pickup truck. And boy, can we get frustrated with the timing of, Lord, why have you not answered the prayer? Why have you not done this? And then along the way, we can have things where we think God is finally going to do it. He's finally going to answer the prayer. But, but he does it in a way we're not expecting. He does it in a way that we wouldn't have done it. He does it in a way that is not necessarily enjoyable. I got a pickup truck out of the deal. <laughs> but my car also got stolen from me. It wasn't awesome. Paul's going to make it to Rome. But he's got to go on a prison ship that gets destroyed by a, a storm. And it's not great for him. Now, we have, as Christians, two ways to respond in this moment. We could respond like the sailors, just, well, we're going to try our best on our own to fix this and to correct it and get out of the storm and do everything in our power. That was one way they responded. The other way they responded was to just what? Just give up all hope. Throw their hands in the air, throw all the tackle and all the gear overboard and say, it's over, we've got no future. Kind of like me standing in a parking spot, spinning in circles, going, well, it's gotta be here somewhere. Or we could follow the example of Paul, we could respond like him. So if you go down to verse 21, Paul begins to speak. Now it's interesting that this whole time Luke hasn't talked about what Paul's been doing, and Paul's just been sitting there watching. Super helpful guy. <laughs> And this is what he's going to say in verse 21. Since they had been without food for a long time, Paul stood up among them and finally said something. And he says this, men, you should have listened to me and not have set sail from Crete and incurred this injury and loss. Great. Great time to stand up and tell someone what? What does Paul say? I told you so. This is, this is a terrible sermon so far. Okay. If I just got up here one day and was like, open your Bibles, you heathens. And you did. And then we read a bunch of stuff where the Lord said not to do it, it would be consequences. And then you have those consequences. I go, I told you so, let's pray. None of you are coming up to me afterwards going, thank you, Lord. That was great. I'm, I'm so glad the way that God spoke to you through, or spoke to me through you today, right? You wouldn't be doing that. This, Paul's opening line is essentially, I just want everybody to know, I told you so. Okay. But thankfully, Paul has a conclusion to this sermon that is much more comforting than I told you so. Verse 22, he goes on, yet now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. 
Now, if you are the sailors and you are the soldiers and you're everybody else on board and you've seen how hard this storm is, how destructive it's been, how there's been no solutions, no way forward, we've thrown all of our food, all of our gear, everything overboard, that's a hard statement to believe, right? Paul looking at you going, don't worry, take heart, no one's gonna die. If you're one of the sailors that spent a long time without food in the middle of this, you're going, what is this crazy man talking about? Because that's what it feels like, right? When we're struggling with God's time, and we're struggling with God's uh, methods and manners of how he gets us from place to place and guides us, and we're struggling with why are we in this storm? Why is the ship being battered and there's no hope? You're going, oh, right, don't worry about it. Take heart. There's not gonna be any loss of life. And then Paul tells us why we can take heart. For this very night, there stood before me an angel of God to whom I belong and whom I worship. And he said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. So take heart, men, for I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told. But we must run aground on some island. So there's a couple of things here of how Paul responds. The, the sailors respond in the way we all typically respond. This panic, trying to fix it ourselves, and when we can't fix it ourselves, it's kind of giving up hope. So there's no, there's no point in trying, there's no future here. But Paul responds in faith in two ways. One is, he trusts in the current promises of God. He says, tonight an angel came to me and told me what? You're gonna, you're gonna make it to Caesar, which means what? Somehow you're gonna survive this storm. Somehow the Lord is gonna get you through here and you're gonna make it to Caesar. Now here's the other thing about this promise of God that Paul is trusting. It's not just a present and brand new one. It's three and a half years old. Way back in Acts 23, what did Jesus tell Paul? You're gonna make it to Rome, and you're gonna preach to Caesar. But it's been three and a half years of holding on to that promise. It hasn't happened yet. Now I'm on a boat that's sinking. How the heck am I gonna make it to Rome and talk to Caesar? And the angel goes to Paul in the midst of the crisis, in the midst of the ship sinking, in the midst of the storm, and says, do you remember that promise that God made to you all those years ago? I'm here to remind you he's gonna keep it. So Paul says, here is the promise that God has made to me. Here is the promise that God has made to you as his people. And then the other act of faith is not just saying the promise, not just knowing the promise, but trusting in it for with his very life. Because he says, after he tells them this promise in verse 25, he says, take heart, man, for I have faith in God that it will be what? Exactly as I have been told. What is Paul saying? I've been given this promise by God way back in the past. He's renewed it, reminded me of it here in the present. And Paul's saying, but I have faith that he will do exactly what? What his word says, what he has promised. In the Book of Concord, our, our Lutheran confessions, they quote Martin Luther as saying that the definition of faith is that someone would trust in the promises of God so much that they would put their lives on it a thousand times over. And that's what Paul's doing, right? Paul's literally in what? A life-threatening situation. The boat is in the middle of a massive storm. It's sinking. It's going to crash. It's all going to fall apart. And he goes, what? I have faith that God will do exactly what he has promised for me. Now, here's the negative response to Paul that sometimes we can have when we're feeling a little cynical, a little pessimistic, a little down, right? Well, that sounds really nice, Paul, but I am still on a boat, and I am still what? In the middle of a storm, <laughs> right? And so what I love about Paul is he doesn't stop there of like, look at God's amazing promise and he's gonna keep it. He doesn't give us what many people just call wishful thinking, right? It, oh, it's just a nice idea to get you through some hard days. 
Paul ends his sermon by going, but me, we must run aground on some island somewhere. Imagine if I told you that at the end of the sermon. Right? You've just been like, you know, God loves you, but, you know, bad stuff's still going to happen. Let's pray. How many of you would like that conclusion? Or would it be like, can you say something else besides that? Right? What does Paul do? He's like, look, guys, God made a promise. God's going to keep a promise. He's going to do exactly what he says. But we're going to run aground on an island. But see, this is what real faith or real hope looks like in this real world. It is not just wishful thinking of maybe God will do something. It's not just trying to pep ourselves up and hype ourselves up to say, I mean, you know, I've been having a really bad time, but you know what? Today's the day we're just going to kind of turn it around. We're going to get out of the storm. See, what Paul is saying is, look, I have a real faith. I have real promises from God that you can trust in real life, even when the storm is happening, even when the ship runs aground on some island. Because for Paul, faith and hope, and in the Bible, faith and hope are way more than just nice ideas or wishful thinking or just trying to be optimistic to get through a bad time. They are promises that sustain you for the three and a half plus years, that they sustain you for the whole storm. They sustain you beyond the storm. In the Bible, the word for hope, at least in the Old Testament, is the word kava. And it describes three strands that are tightly bound together that you can hold on to, meaning they won't break. Right? Ecclesiastes very famously says a strand of three cords is not easily broken. And that's our word for hope. This kavad, to, to, to wait, but waiting by these three strands that cannot be easily broken and saying, these are the promises that God has given to me. So even when the ship is sinking, even when I'm in a storm, even when I'm going to run aground on some island, guess what? I have this promise and I have this hope that I can hold on to that's not easily broken meaning it's not broken at all. In Romans chapter five, speaking of Rome and Paul, he says this, hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Paul says, we have hope. It's not going to disappoint us. It's not going to let us down. It's not going to put us to shame because it's not easily broken. It's this strong three-string cord that you and I can hold on to in the midst of anything in life. And his evidence is even we have God's love that's been poured into our lives. We have the Holy Spirit. We have God with us in the midst of all things. And then he says, at the right time. See, the evidence that God will keep his promises, that his timing is good for you, Paul says in Romans 5, is that at the right time, Christ died on the cross for you. It took a long time from the promise in Genesis chapter 3 to Good Friday. But Paul says, see, it was in God's right timing that Christ died for you to give you his perfect love and the Holy Spirit. So when you and I are facing storms and we're on ships and we feel like, well, we're going to crash somewhere and I don't know where or when this is going to be resolved, Paul says you can trust God's promises because you have a hope that's not easily broken and you can trust his timing because his timing is always perfect. If you ever forget that his timing is perfect, Paul says, just look at the cross because it was at the right time that Jesus came to forgive and save you. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks that at the right time you came to be our savior, to forgive our sins, and to pour out your love upon us. Help us, O oh Lord, when we feel like the sailors and soldiers on the ship, facing storms that are unrelenting, feeling like there is no hope or future, that you would remind us of the promises you have made to us, that we respond in faith like the Apostle Paul, trusting in your promises here and now and every day in the future, knowing that your timing is perfect because you have given to us your love in Christ Jesus.
In your name we pray. Amen.